Father, how you love us so much, and we are thankful, Lord God, for that love. God, you love us in a way that is difficult for us to understand because while we were still enemies of yours, you loved us and sent your son. For many of us to love those who are like enemies, that would be difficult to do. But your love, Father, is a love that is beyond all love that we've ever known. And we are thankful that you love us. Thankful that you loved us so much that you've forgiven our sins through Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. God, that your love, that it fills us, that it pulls us, that it draws us. God, we are thankful for that love. It's one of the reasons we worship you. And we are thankful that we were able to worship you this morning, that even though we were not here together, that home, we were joined together by our worship, worshiping of one heart and one mind, worshiping one God. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be able to do it this morning. Father, we pray that as we continue to move on in this service, as we devote ourselves to hearing from you, as we devote ourselves to hearing the truth of your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move and that he would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, that God, we would see and hear clearly and believe what your Spirit is saying to us. For we know that you have a word that transforms our lives and transforms our perspectives, our hearts, Father, as you desire to turn us toward you, as you desire for us to see you clearer as you desire for us to see you and know you in a deeper way, we pray, God, that you would do it today. So, Father, we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, Designer's Way. Good morning, everybody who is joining us on this stream this morning. We are excited that you are here with us and that you have decided to step into D-Way stream this morning. But we have a word for you, and I want to get right to sharing that word with you. Uh, we're going to be reading a passage this morning out of uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. That's where we're going to be. And uh, when we get to our text, uh, we're going to be using the NIV, and you are welcome to read along if you have a Bible with you, but you don't have a Bible. All of the scriptures will appear on the screen below us. But John, the gospel according to John, chapter 17. We have been in the midst of a series here called World Overcomer. And the ironic thing for me in regard to this series is that our Christian culture speaks Christian truths all the time. We sing songs about them. We, we say all the quotes about them. We memorize all the little mottos. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. We have all of that stuff down. Yet oftentimes, so the, the, the principles of our faith don't necessarily always seem to appear to line up with our reality. So we sing songs about joy, but we feel depressed. And we sing songs about victory, yet feel we're losing. We listen to sermons about world overcoming, yet feel like the world is constantly overcoming us. And what I want to do and what I desire to do, I, I don't want to just preach some message to you that sounds good. I don't want to just preach something to you and share something to you that makes you go hallelujah. I actually want to be able to teach you the truths of the scriptures in a way that you can practically apply it to your life so that the truths of the scriptures become the truths of of your life. And this series about world overcoming, this is really what this is about. Because when we look at Jesus and what he did, the reason why the scriptures declare that Jesus has overcome the world, the reason why Jesus said to his disciples, take heart, be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world, is because for Jesus, this was a reality. That Jesus lived inside the world, yet did not bow down to its rules or its principles, that he lived in this world, but didn't live like it in any way. He lived above it. And Jesus is our example. Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers, and we are the brothers and sisters born behind them through the Holy Spirit. Jesus overcame the world. He showed that it was possible to live abo above the world's principles, and then he paved the way so that we could do the same. That's what this series is about. This is why it was so important in week two for me to let you know that just as Jesus had overcome the world, the scriptures also say that we have overcome 
the world. So last week, I spent some time just trying to show you that, all right, we are world overcomers. Let's see what we've overcome. Let's be able to identify the world. If it's not from God, it's from the world. Only two places where you're getting things. If it's not from God, it's from the world. And I want us to be able to identify the world so that we know what we've overcome. I want to close the series today with this last principle, this last truth. And it's found in John chapter 17. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number 14. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus is praying for his disciples in this text. And here's what it says. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. In this first verse, Jesus teaches two truths. The first one is very simple. The word changes people. God's word transforms people to the degree where they are different from the world. And what is different from the world, the world hates. And Jesus is saying, not only this, but the world hated me, so the world hates you. Very simple principle. The second truth is why. And I want you to see this because um, the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5 makes a statement where he says, the spirit and the sinful nature are in conflict with one another so much that you cannot do what you want. The spirit and the sinful nature are in conflict. And beloved, there is no middle ground. There is black, there is white, one side or another, but there is no middle. There's no place where you can hide from the influence of the conflict between the flesh, the sinful nature, and the spirit of God. Jesus says this in Mark chapter 12. He says, you're either for me or against me. You either gather with me or you scatter. Jesus is saying, look, you're either on my side or you're not on my side. You're either helping to do what I'm trying to do or you're actually opposing what I'm trying to do. And beloved, there is no middle ground. There is no black. There is no white. There is no place in the middle of that. It's one side or the next. The Lord's brother in James chapter 4, James says this in chapter 4, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. (laughs) Black and white with no middle. Do you realize that there's, there's no place to stand? Friends of the world or enemy of God, there's no middle ground. And what Jesus is teaching his disciples in this First text in this moment where he's saying to them, I've given you the word and the world has hated you. What he's saying to them is he's saying, look, there is a conflict and there is no middle ground in this conflict. And I got to tell you, beloved, it's not because the world and the kingdom are different and they are. And it's not because the world and the kingdom of God are opposites because they're not. The world is not equal to God. There is a conflict because they both struggle. They both desire the same thing, but only one of them can have it. And what they both desire is your affection, your attention, your devotion. God wants your affection, and he wants your attention, and he wants your devotion. The world wants your affection and your attention, and your devotion. And when God has your affections, when God has your attention and your devotion, the world loses. And the scriptures call the God of this world Satan. He loses. And so when Satan loses and the world loses, it hates you because of it. This is why the very next thing that Jesus says is, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. 
I, I want to I help you to understand this by taking you to something that you might be familiar with. Um, in the book of Mark, Jesus in chapter 12 decides that he wants to sit right across from the place at the temple where the offering is brought. And the scriptures make a point to say that he chose to sit and watch. He's watching people as they bring their offering. And I want to tell you, he's not watching people and what they give. He's watching people's hearts. And so one of the things that Jesus sees is he sees a widow who is poor and she comes and she gives her offering and what Jesus sees in her, he wants to share. In fact, the scriptures say that he calls his disciples over and says to them, everyone who gave, gave out of their wealth. But this woman gave all that she had in life, all that she had to live on. Jesus called attention to this woman because he wanted the disciples to see the example of someone whose heart had been totally devoted to God. Because what Jesus saw in this woman is that the world meant nothing and God meant everything. Listen to me when I say this to you. This is in the text as Jesus is saying it. Because he said that she gave all that she had to live on. That was her world. And she gave it all in the temple's offering because it meant nothing and God meant everything. Beloved, do you know that Jesus wasn't really talking about giving? <laughs> He's not teaching about giving here. He's teaching about the condition of the heart. He's teaching about someone who's devoted to God at such a level that the world means nothing. He's teaching that if somebody loves God to the degree where the world means nothing, this kind of person, I need to be in the world because the world needs to see that there are individuals who are devoted to God, that there are individuals for whom the world really doesn't mean anything, that there are individuals who put God first above all other things. He needs these people to live so that other people in the world see that this is possible. This is the life that Jesus lived for us. And this is the life that he wants his disciples to continue to live. This is why he prays for them. And he prays that God would protect them from the evil one. Because he knows that whenever there is a person whose devotion for God rises above the devotion and love that the world has in it. And the person believes that God is more important than all other things and that there's nothing in the world that binds them and keeps them. That this person would rather lose all things if they can still have God. When that kind of person lives, the world and the God of this world, their lies are exposed. It shows that the principles of the world don't really work as well as the world wants you to think they do. That the joys and the pleasures of the world are not as great as the world wants you to think that they are. And so God desires for people. Jesus is asking, Father, don't take them out of the world. Let them stay in because they are devoted to you. Let them stay in the world, but protect them from the evil one that they can show the world. That there, are, that there is a devotion to God that is higher and more important than everything in the world. And then he says this, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Um, <clears throat> last week when I was talking about salvation, I made an analogy. I was talking about when someone signs up for the Marines, and I was saying, listen, once they sign and once they take the oath, they are officially a Marine. Even if they have not learned all of the skills yet necessary that we equate with Marines, the combat skills, the fighting skills, the weapon skills, they haven't learned any of that yet, yet they are a Marine. The thing that separates them from being citizens to Marines. The thing that makes them different is when they learn those skills. Beloved, sanctification is the thing that sets you apart. That's what it means. The word sanctify means to set apart. 
See, once you get saved, once you believe, you're a saint, you're a believer, you're a son, a daughter of God. But the thing that sanctifies you, the thing that separates you is the truth. This is what Jesus says, right? Sanctify them by the truth. But what does he say the truth is? Thy word, God, is truth. So Jesus is saying God's word is the truth. Sanctifying separates you and you are sanctified by the truth. And what is the truth? The word of God. Now look, I know that there are some of you who are already like, all right, Pastor Ron, I know the next note to this song, obey the word of God. No, (laughs) that's not what I'm saying at all. Do you know that it's possible, and many believers live this way, it's possible to force yourself to obey, struggle to obey the truths of the kingdom while still believing to some degree that the facts of the world are also true. Uh, Let's, single folks, let me just say this. If you're single and you're saved, one of the characteristics that tends to follow being single and saved while in the world is loneliness. And so there are many single believers, young, single, and saved believers who are lonely. And that loneliness is a fact of the world. The reality is you have God, and since you do, you're never alone. Jesus said this. Jesus, when he was on his way to be crucified, when he was eating that last supper, he was saying, look, it's going to look like I'm alone, but I'm not alone because the Father is with me. But see, the world (laughs) makes it seem like because you're not booed up that you're alone. And the fact of that loneliness begins to wear on you. And there are many single saved believers who find someone who has some interest in them. And then because there's interest and they're no longer alone, compromise sets in. Where young ladies will date and kind of hang out and spend time with guys who don't even claim Jesus as Lord, or they hang out with guys who claim Jesus is Lord, but who don't have any fruit of discipleship and Christ following in their lives whatsoever, and spend time. That compromise is an indication that the facts of the world are being equated with the truths of God's word. See, the scriptures say, do not be unequally yoked. So I'm talking about where you're getting to a place where the truths of the kingdom are the only truths by which you're willing to live your life. See, I'm not just talking about struggling to obey. I'm not talking about forcing yourself to obey the scriptures. I'm talking about being in a place where your mind doesn't see anything but the truth of the scriptures as the only way to live where there is no compromise, where there is no wrestle because you realize that what the world has to offer cannot really give you what you're looking for. So often we have, um, we have a, 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 a yearning inside of us that is unsatisfied. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where there seems to be nothing that you do that gives you any real satisfaction. Like you're bored with everything. You're bored with watching the shows you used to watch. You're bored with doing whatever activities you used to do. You're bored and like there's nothing that satisfies your soul. And the reason why is because God desires to satisfy your soul. And there's nothing in this world that can satisfy you when the Spirit of God is living on the inside of you except Him. And see, when you get to a place where you recognize clearly that there's nothing in this world that can compare to him, and you have a desire for him, you have a desire to walk in his truths, because nothing else seems like real life. Where the kingdom of God is the only kingdom whose rules and principles you're willing to live by. Then you are a world overcomer. See, I'm not talking about behavior modification. I'm talking about mind transformation. I'm talking about where your mind is on a different level 
where it's come above the world to where you think differently than the world does. Jesus says it happens by the word which sanctifies. So I'm saying to you, read the word and don't read it thinking, I need to obey. <laughs> read it and allow it to transform your heart. Read God's word, read the scriptures and allow those words to penetrate your mind. Read those words and realize that there are a set of principles and rules and laws, and I'm not talking about laws and do's and don'ts, I'm talking about laws like natural laws. There are natural laws within the kingdom of God, but all of the kingdom's principles are higher than the world's. And I'm saying as you read the scriptures, allow the scriptures to change your mind. Allow them to change the way that you see the world because God's truths overrule, override, all of the world's facts. And as you're walking in those truths, you are walking as a world overcomer. <clears throat> I want to take a moment to pray because I know that as you've heard this message that there may be some of you who are saying, Pastor Ron, I hear what you're saying and I see areas in my life and in my own life, I see that there are things of the world that I have set above God. Or you're saying, Pastor Ron, I, I realize I have not really given God's truths the place in my life and in my heart that I should. And I really want to live as a world overcomer. And so if that's you, while you're at home right now, I just want you to bow your head. I want you to lift your hands like this just in a, in a posture of, of receiving, and I want to pray for you. Eternal Father and Almighty God, Father, there is nothing in this entire world, not a house, not a car, not any clothing, not any amount of money, there is nothing in this world, God, that is greater than you. And I realize, Father, that so many of us as we've lived in this world, the world has taught us that there is all kinds of satisfaction and pleasure and all of these other things. But God, we know that there is nothing that fulfills the satisfaction of our hearts more than you. And so Father, I'm praying for those who are right now at home with their hands lifted. I'm praying God that you would begin to speak to them in a way and give them revelation God, that radically transforms the way they see the world around them. I'm not asking God for them to just simply obey in a way that's frustrating and feeling like their obedience is a constant struggle. What I'm asking for, God, is for them to have an understanding of your kingdom to where your principles and your truths are high above uh, everything else in the world and nothing else matters. Father, I'm praying that there would be a pursuit of you, God, that's genuine and from their hearts, that God, they would search for you and they would be willing to cast off everything to have you. For we know, God, that there is no greater possession than you. Father, I'm praying that these folks who have their hands lifted right now that God, they would have a transformation of mind. This is what Paul was talking about when he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit would assist them in the renewing of their minds. So much so that as the scriptures say that we are world overcomers, as the scriptures say they are world overcomers, that what the scriptures have said would be the reality that they live and experience. So Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in each of these people who are saying to you this morning, God, I want you more than the world and I want to walk and live as a world overcomer. I thank you, Father, for allowing me to pray on their behalf. I pray that you see their hearts, that God, you will answer this prayer and that they will be radically changed. For those of you who are watching, there may be some of you who you've heard all of this and some of it seems foreign to you. 
this idea of world overcoming and this idea of the world meaning nothing and God meaning everything, I understand that. It's because the reality of that kind of understanding comes from a heart that has been transformed. And the only way that a heart can be transformed is by allowing Jesus to take residence up on the inside of it, allowing Jesus to set his throne up on your heart that he is your Lord. He said, no one gets to the Father but through me. And if you want to chase after God, it's done through Jesus. That is a part of the essential nature of the gospel, that your sins can be forgiven. And I need you to understand that your sins being forgiven isn't even really about just your sins being forgiven. Your sins being forgiven is an open door and an opportunity to have a relationship and fellowship and intimacy with the God who created the universe. And so if you are saying, Pastor Ron, you know what? I want that. I want to have this relationship with God. Then the scriptures are clear. The scriptures say all you have to do is believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he is the son of the living God, and that he's raised from the dead. If you believe that, your sins are forgiven. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. My sins don't count against me. But even more so, you are now in a place where you can have a relationship with the God who created you, who knit you and formed you together in your mother's womb, who gifted you with the talents and the abilities and the skills and the likes and the dislikes, who gave you your hair and your eyes, who just formed you together. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have the opportunity now to have a relationship with God, a relationship where he's as real to you as anyone else that you see. This is the greatest aspect of the gospel. So if you want to do that, you're saying, Pastor Ron, I want that relationship, then all you have to do is simply say this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. And thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I repent today of all sin and all wrongdoing. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, set a throne on my heart, and be my Lord. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for your grace. Amen. If you said that prayer, if you gave your life today, I want to know about it. You can email me, Pastor Ron at designersway.org. I want to know that you have made this decision. This is the most epic decision you could ever make in your life. And I also want to be able to make some recommendations for you for next steps. If you live in this city, then we, obviously we want to be your church family. We want to be your home. But if you live in another city, maybe I know a pastor uh, who loves the Lord and loves his people, who, can, who is, his fellowship can continue to walk by you. But I want to know if you made this decision. It's the best thing that you could ever do. That's it. We have finished our series, World of a Comer. I will see you guys next week. I'm starting a new series next week. And this series, beloved, as I've been in prayer before the Lord, this series, I think, is going to change the, oh, it is, it is going to shift. I don't use that word because y'all know I don't like religious stuff. <laughs> I, sometimes I hear shift. I start thinking, oh my gosh, you're spooky deep. No, listen, I, I believe that this message series that the Lord has given me next is a message series that is just going to radically change the way that our church sees God and pursues God. So next week, stick with me. I love you guys. Peace. God bless.